Uh, Bishop, thank you very much for joining us and in these talks on reimagining. And I should say, um, the reason we having these talks is um, <clears throat> actually um, sparked by your talk at, at Synod. And so I enjoyed that talk and I thought it's okay for us to engage it and also for the congregations of Tokai and Musenberg to engage together on this topic of reimagining healing and transformation. So thank you for being with us. I uh, hope I'm not going to keep you long. It's cold and wet. <laughs> and um, Maxine as well, thank you for joining us again and uh, for sharing in this talk. Um, we then shall start off with a prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we can have the moments like these to, to talk and to engage on some of the topics that you put in our hearts. We hope that as we engage in them, they will not just only stay in our hearts, but also put into action and influence who we are. Help us, dear Lord, as your church, to be the light that you call us to be. Help us as your church to be one, as you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. And help us all the more to express your love in the world so that the world may believe. Teach us what it means to be a church in a time such as this, so we may faithfully serve the present age. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> Bishop, the way it will work, we have tried to get some difficult questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> a few, no, 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 I'm joking. <laughs> Just some questions based on your talk to Synod, at Synod, on your address to Synod, um, which was a lovely address. And I should say the address has been distributed to the congregations, so they have it for them to read. So our questions will just be light and um, just asking, engaging you on what we read or read from your talk to Synod. I'll give a time for Maxine to say hello to you and maybe kick us off with one of the questions that she has. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sakao. It's a wonderful privilege, privilege to be part of something like this. And it's a topic that has been on my mind even before we started talking about it, thinking, how do we do church? in this day and age and just around the people that I'm hearing what they're saying. And so, yeah, I'm very excited to be a part of this. Thank you. And Bishop, what a wonderful privilege for me to be with you in this kind of setting. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I'll start off in, in the opening part of your address, you just spoke about how we could have hope uh, because Jesus is alive and he is our risen Lord. And so my first question is, I mean, for me personally, I've been faced with people who are saying, you know, where is God in all of this? Um, and people who are hurting, obviously, with the loss of losing loved ones. What would advice would you give um, for us as believers who have this hope to those who are hurting and grieving and asking the question, where is God in all of this? Right. Evening um, both to you, Reverend Michael Barlow, um, as well as, um, and as we say, I know we also talk to you as Sikawa, and I hope that's the kind of relationship we have. Um, thank you, Maxine, for the invitation. Wonderful to be in your circuit and amongst you um, in this new way. Um, indeed, I, I'm, thank you. I, I want to say it's a very real it's a very important question. I think the most important thing to say is we must give permission to people to ask that question. And I thought about it because a lot of people think because we are faithful, we shouldn't get angry. We shouldn't be asking this. I want to say it is the right response. What I love is when that response is taken to God. God, why are you doing this? Because we are addressing a God who knows us, who loves us, 
And in fact, we're engaging, I think, what people have done from the beginning of ages. If you read the Bible, Old Testament, particularly Psalms, it's exactly what the psalmist and many others. God, where are you in this? Why don't you? You know? And so for me, it, it says, let's be honest. Um, I think that's the first thing I would want to say. I think the second thing is we must remember the risen Lord is risen because he was crucified. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't talk about the resurrected Lord. Mm -hmm. And so crucifixion is very real. And I think what we're experiencing is the pain of that, you know, um, and pain has different sources. Um, it's not that we are being crucified, but we certainly are going through a measure of suffering that, that you know, we can't even name in some cases. Mm. But my hope lies precisely in the resurrected Lord, because the same resurrected Lord went through the process of crucifixion. And that experience of utter pain and death in which Jesus himself says, my God, why have you forsaken? He gives us permission to say, God, you know, this is not fair or this doesn't feel right or where are you? Um, I think that's it. So for me, the, almost the answer is be honest, take it to God, but recognize the crucified God is right here where we are. Jesus stands at a, you know, the gravesite knowing he's going to offer resurrection and his response is he weeps. And so I find comfort in the fact that Christ is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bishop. And <clears throat> that is actually very true, you know. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, God will hear the cries of those who yes. suffer. Um, and, yes. and that's the God we, ca we came to know throughout mm -hmm. Scripture, is a God who listens to those who are in pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, also, in your in in your address, um, Bishop, um, speaking about uh, suffering and pandemics, um, you 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 mentioned the pandemic of poverty, if I can put it that mm -hmm. way, and the gap between the rich and the poor. That how how much of that um, impacts on our mission and ministry, particularly at, at the Synod? Sure. Thank you. I think those are the deep questions. Um, I mean, as for the other one, and it might have been used a little bit much, but something that has helped me is, you know, in one of these posters or somewhere, somebody put the, the point, uh, we may all be facing the same storm, mm. but we are not in the same boat. And that thing for me is, is very real. The pandemic itself has really opened the cracks that have already existed for so long. And one of the key ones, I think, um, and let me use it in our context, in our synod, is this crack of poverty. The fact is people are engaging in this storm, but in different boats. Um, and so the, the, you know, the, the notion even of isolation which is so important in terms of just trying to, to, to at least create a space um, for this virus not to, you know, this flattening the curve thing cannot actually happen. You know, when we're talking about, you know, more than two thirds, and this is particularly where our synod is, find themselves in areas which are flooded, which are overcrowded, you know, um, and, and again, based on systemic, I talk later on the systemics, we can't run away from that. We are built on a system of systemic racism, privilege. Um, you know, the time had this interesting photo and it was taken above Cape Town where you can have your super rich areas, Constantius and so forth, lined up right alongside the Haute Bay, the, you know, the various, the Cape Flats. So it's a visible, you just from the air can see the difference on the two sides. It's very real in our synod. Um, we, and again, I, I guess I couldn't be quoted, I, I don't want to say the majority, but I would 
as I see it, the vast majority of our members find themselves in poverty-ridden areas. Um, you know, I, I went to do um, one of our conventions in Blue Downs, and just driving into the areas, you know, um, which knew the new settlement areas called quarantine and so forth, it just stretches on endlessly. Mm-hmm. Somebody, I was in a in a conversation with somebody who said, you know, what they find strange is people say, why are people lining up for that 250, 350? Why are they fighting for an additional 10 rand? Why would people stand in the rain, endanger their own safety for a meager 350 rand? And the response is because people are desperate. 350 in one person's pocket means a meal at the spur. Hmm. It may mean, you know, but for another person, that is the income that they would even, you know, um, give their life to stand in a queue for that. Hmm. So I think in terms of our mission and and ministry in the Synod, um, the line of poverty um, is incredible. That that gap, you know, is is incredibly huge. Um, I'm sure you would be saying, and what does that mean for us? And I think historically, you know, there's there's a lot of conversation around this concept of geographic circuits, mm. um, and the idea, what was lying behind it. One, I think, one of the concepts was, you know, it was around ministry, but it was also around the fact that we begin to see one another in partnerships. You know, and and carry one another because traditionally we had circuits that were often, you know, in in areas that, you know, were impoverished and were receiving like a handout ministry from others. My understanding of some of the geographic circuit thinking was let's put people together where there is more room to engage with one one another in real ways. Um, Because the genius of the Methodist church is we are connected in circuits. Circuit means that this is not about one congregation, one society, but a circuit where, you know, those who have better resources come alongside those who have less resources or recognize a financial resource is not the power you hold. Because you might have other resources, which is more necessary, experience, um, and so forth. Um, Those are some of the things bubbling in my mind. I'm not giving you, I guess, a straight answer. (laughs) Yes, yes, Um, indeed, yes, indeed. And uh, it's been a a, a fight, um, a historic fight for a long, long time, this gap. But it is sad to see it being widening and widening and widening. Mm-hmm. Um, even in, in, in these current times. And as you rightly say, the cracks were just exposed by COVID, mm-hmm. you know, more than anything, more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think then maybe even through geographic circuits, for those who don't know geographic circuits, as the bishop says, um, <clears throat> you, would, you would even go as far back as the Group Areas Act, if you want, mm-hmm. Um, where we were grouped according to races. So circuits as well were formed in racial lines. But later on, with the notion of the Methodist Church uh, or a dream of the Methodist Church that we are one and undivided church, came about these other ideas and amongst them was geographic circuits where we grouped congregations together Um, not along racial lines, but rather right across both Mm -hmm. race as well as um, financial muscle or economic status or whatever you Mm want to call it. Um, So they were all grouped together for meaningful engagement, not just for a handout type of Mm -hmm. ministry. Mm -hmm. So that's what geographic circuits were in a nutshell. Um, Mm. Do you think then as a church, we are well equipped to address these these pandemics, to be the light that Christ wants us to be in these um, situations of darkness? 
I actually do. I, you know, I, I have faith in church, in the church of Christ and in, in disciples of Christ. But the, the challenge is that we don't always see it. <laughs> it is so easy for us to fall into this historic trap. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it is this, you know, handout mentality, better or worse exclusion, inclusion. Um, I have the finances, so I have the right to call the shots, you know, versus, you know, what power do you have and so forth. And I think it's an age, it's an age old struggle. I'm, I'm sure, you know, again, I'm talking church language, but we sometimes go to courtly meetings where we make decisions where it feels like those who have resources sometimes have more of a say than those who have less financial resources. Mm. And, and for me, the partnership is beginning to say, hey, you know, let's get to know each other and let's help one another in terms of understanding the richness we have. I mean, there's something for me terrible about walking into a church service where there's exclusively one race group, one language, one particular style, you know, and, and if we even, even, able to open that to say oh wow this is fantastic you know I can, I, there's a richness in worship together you know there's a richness in engaging for me one of the key areas is when we engage in projects together but then we go as equals you know mm -hmm. one of the things for instance we do in the synod we we ask new ministers every new minister gets a pair of shoes and we, and we invite that minister to go and investigate in their area what schools are there and, and you know, enable some form of involvement, engagement across the, the synod or across the circuit, you know, to maybe twin with a particular school. Um, and it's, it's, it's been amazing when I watch how some people have multiplied a pair of school shoes into many school into many school shoes or uniforms or after classes, you know, those kinds of things, using your expertise, you know, retired teachers or available, you know, for aftercare and and you know specialized resources. So I think I think we are well placed to to engage with some of those areas in the pandemic. The problem is we sometimes get locked into our old ways. Um, you know, <laughs> we do, <laughs> and it's hard to, it, it takes intentional examination um, of what we're doing. Maybe just one simple thing, worship. <laughs> it's incredible. We have churches within walking distance, if not driving distance, some in literally walking distance. Um, and during hard lockdown it was amazing to see how churches twinned in virtual services mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. i'm touching it because i think i saw it in some in yours mm -hmm. but as soon as we opened up we went back to our buildings <laughs> and here's a wonderful mission opportunity to say if we could worship together in that way how could we better use the buildings we have to say that's best suited for maybe worship but this we could use in a different way for me, that's dealing with some of the pandemic stuff um, and actively engaging, particularly with the most vulnerable. Maxine, me and the <laughs> bishop are ministers. We talk a lot, so I don't well, want us to be the only one talking. So please do. No, no, I'm, I'm taking it all in. I just wanted to make a comment. I was reading, um, uh, I read a commentary the other day, and one of the comments in there was, that someone who doesn't, who was like a professor and very forward thinking and very innovative, he came home one day and his wife had moved the furniture around and he became very upset with her that she'd <laughs> moved the furniture. And she said, you know, I thought that you as this progressive person would be quite happy for the change. She said, no, I'm, I'm happy with the change as long as everything stays the same. <laughs> and it just made me think that's, that's sometimes where we get stuck as a church is we, we, we talk about change, but when change actually comes, then we get we get a bit wobbly and we don't really enjoy that. Um, so yeah, I think we definitely need to think about doing things in a different way, and that's exciting. I mean, I think about Sakao, the the service we had where the Westlake Sunday School children came to sing for us mm -hmm. in their own language, in their own mm -hmm. style, and it was absolutely beautiful. It was so enriching 
just to yeah. have that cross-cultural engagement. I mean, even my children loved it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think to have more of that, to not get stuck in one way of doing things, we have to. I feel like we don't have another choice at this point. We have to do that. Mm. Yeah, having, having said that, may I ask my next question? Mm. Um, I, I read a, an interesting book, um, just a short little book that written by John Piper and entitled Christ and the Coronavirus. And in there, he, he talks about a lot of um, reasons why he thinks God is, for lack of a better word, allowing this pandemic to happen. What is, what is God trying to do through this pandemic? And in your address, Bishop, you spoke about us singing a new song. And so in your mind, what, what do you think God is trying to say to us through this pandemic? What song do you think he is wanting us to sing? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to say some of the things we do has to, it's going to take courage because doing the very things you mentioned, it, it's a courageous act to say, I'm going to think and act differently. Um, and yeah. so I think we've been called to that courageous thing. And yes, it was Professor Pillay. I, I quoted that story. Oh, <laughs> sorry, yes, of course. Oh. <laughs> Which is fantastic, but that's what we want. This thing of, I don't want it to be the same. So what is this new song? Just the background to that. Remember, as a faithful people, you know, people sing their faith. Mm -hmm. You know, again, the whole Bible is filled with the songs of whether it's songs of lament, you know, sadness and crying to God, you know, all the way right back we read from Genesis um, and all the way. But particularly in the exile, there's this comment that is made, you know, in the Psalms, you know, in exile, um, you know, those in exile, they don't have Jerusalem, they don't have the temple, who for them, that was where God was. <laughs> and, and I think we got ourselves locked in that if we can't go to church, we can't go to church and i'm careful because we are the church but the sense we can't go to church what do we have and so yeah. the exiles cry so how are we to sing the lord's song in this strange land yeah. and that kind of got me thinking around this idea of singing as methodists in particular we know we are born in song <laughs> And, and we express ourselves in song and worship. It's probably the thing we feel most because it's it's hard on online to engage in corporate worship. Mm -hmm. It's always been my thing. It's beautiful. You hear beautiful singing, but there's something very different when we sing together. And mm -hmm. then when we began to reopen under the advice of our advisory team, we were told you still can't sing <laughs> because unfortunately <laughs> it's, it's a dangerous activity. You know, the, the issue about this COVID, it's around breathing. And we're discovering yeah. the new variant. It's unfortunately, it's got to do breath. I mean, my very breath, if I breathe over you, is I could cause your death. Yeah. And so singing, unfortunately, because of the way singing, because it comes from inside, it expels that. And so we had to say, you can gather, but you actually can't sing. It was very good. Now we've said sing limited behind a mask, you know. And so yeah. this, this, this idea of learning to sing a new song was about saying, how do we engage in meaningful worship that is different? What mm -hmm. is this new song? And I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure what it is. <laughs> I think our engaging in trying to discover this new song is actually where we are called to. Yeah. I do know it is a song, I think that calls from us a deep lament. I want to say part of the song is, is lament. Lament is a deep expression of pain, but directed to God. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that is a song. I don't think we, we understand that very well. And maybe that's something you would want to explore in another Bible series. What, is, what does it mean to lament? lament? I think it's a song of compassion, deep compassion as well. Yeah. Because we are seeing suffering at, beyond COVID. As we said, it's the economic, it's the gender-based violence, it's children yeah. who have left, you know, um, single-headed households. I mean, I was almost in tears at our youth synod when some of our young people, students, said what it was like, you know, having come from somewhere else, parents not having money to bust them back, left alone in hostels with no food, you know, Everything had been invested. The, the NAFSA's funding was up. And just hearing the cries of our young people 
And some saying, I am now the parent in my home because COVID stole my, my grandmother. Mm. You know, because remember the elderly in the beginning, you know, and, and it's normally been, and I particularly say grandmothers, because it has been particularly our, our, our goggles, mm. you know, um, mm. left. And that pain, and so the song of compassion for mm. me is a song we're learning. But I think also a song of, of you know, of just, again, reiterating the faithfulness of God. Because God has carried us from one generation to the other. And so when I'm saying I don't have an answer, but I have a feeling these are some of the songs mm. we begin to learn. You know, yeah. and in fact, we've got to write those songs. Yeah. <laughs> poems and songs. Correct. I mean, there's some amazing poetry and praise, but I wish the singing people must write in this time. Mm. <laughs> Yes. To, ex to give to give expression to how everyone is feeling. Mm. Yeah. And as you said right in the beginning, to give permission to sing those songs of lament. Correct. And actually just get find a way of getting that out because maybe that is where healing begins. Just mm. being able to name your pain and say, I express this and now how can I move forward? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Okay. Can I move on to another question? <laughs> um <clears throat> You know, Bishop, that I'm an achievementist and mission at heart. Those are some of the circles we met before I came here. And um, you spoke about something that is quite close to me, and that's the congruency of a warmed heart and social holiness. Um, so maybe for the sake of those who may not really know what that means, you know, social holiness, which I think is a hinge of our missional drive as Methodists. It's, it's the foundation of who we are as a mission church, because that's what the Methodist church is. Um, so maybe if you can unpack that a little bit, um, yeah, as You're opposed right. to what you termed self-absorbed private faith. Right. I think historically, I mean, if we, if we look a little bit at the at the Wesleys, you know, we must understand, you know, the Wesleys grew up in this pietistical, you know, um, it was, you know, um, me and God, you know, and so long as you said and knew the right things, you know, um, that's the kind of faith experience and tradition that they'd come out of. But even from a very early time, you know, the Wesleyans had, had also, the Wesleyans, if we could say, had understood the reality that, that this pietistical thing must give, must be expressed in your everyday life. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm really trying to get it to the very basics without using huge theological terms. But of course, a warmed heart experience is when that all came together. I mean, John Wesley was already involved in amazing work. You know, as a student, they were, you know, um, not only studying together, but they were visiting um, prisons and, and involved in those kinds of things. And I think in his head, he had it together. But his heart at that point hadn't quite, you know, reached all of those things. So the warmed heart experience, which we call his conversion experience, really just, I, I want to say, set him like the spirit you know, that kind of, I think, in my mind, gave this congruency between, you know, pietistical, you know, right beliefs, understanding who God is, you know, theologically and all sorts, but that that can only be expressed mm. in a faith that, that encounters and actively engages, particularly with the most vulnerable. So social holiness, my understanding is you, you can't be, say, I'm holy, I love God. You know, it's all that this is about. Without understanding, I cannot love God without loving the people God loves. You know, loving neighbor. Um, in fact, his whole we the Wesleyan rule of life that was developed was, was all about do no harm, do good. It was all social concepts mm. and stay mm. loved. You know, attend the ordinances of God was the original, which is about follow the disciplines. Look at he, we, we cannot have one without the other. Okay. I think it's what feeds 
one another. And I must admit, even in the role I am at, I'm understanding that better and better. I can't lead out of my head. Mm. I can't just have the facts. I can't also just love God and say, so long as I'm doing my prayers and I'm meditating, the two flow into one another. Mm. Um, And so I I think that's why I was saying you can't have a prime me and my God. You know, this pandemic in particular, I think, calls us to a closer walk with God. You know, more than ever, I mean, I cannot sustain my faith, you know, without spending a lot of time with God. But it's as I draw closer to the crucified God, because let's remember that's the crucified God. Um, I think Peter's story has a wonderful, if you go, his talk that he gave at the SMMS, the seminary thing. When you gaze upon the crucified Christ, you can do no other than to gaze upon the people that he loved so dearly. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's this concept of we can't church pray and go home. <laughs> I'm okay with God. No, it is yeah. it's the two flow into one another. Um, Similarly, yes. even they should. It's, it's not it's like that, yeah. <laughs> It's actually one of the first things that I remember covering in the TEEC course um, was faith and life go together, and you know, yes. they couldn't they couldn't be separated, and that was um, yeah, it was just very encouraging for me to see that my life needed to mimic what I was saying. I couldn't just say good things and preach good things. I had to actually live that out as well. So yeah, that made that makes a lot of sense to me. Um. um. This after, this morning was um, Reverend Tapelo Diloque's funeral, and yes. um, very ably, very ably, you know how Michelle Hansrott is with his oratory and his theological um, acumen. Um, very ably, he put it this way. Um, you, he took it from the Gospel of John. He was just making an analogy and that this word, you remember the word is light and the word gives life or is life, you see. Mm. And so he says, then it should live. It should find expression in life. So Mm. it should not just sit. I'm paraphrasing what he said in the head. It It should be lived out. And so, yes, it's it's not just head, it's heart, head, hands, and feet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it should be a seamless, seamless flow. Um, I'm wondering if I could follow on there to say, I think that therefore is one of the challenges of being church. Are we equipping people to understand and live this? You know, and I don't think you need a church building to do that. I mean, I, I've I've been trying to say during lockdown and beyond, how have we equipped, that's why I love what you're doing with your Bible study. How have we equipped our class leaders, our Bible study leaders, our preachers to do this discipling, mm-hmm. which, which, you know, makes sense. I mean, if I think many of the programs we do, you know, might have brought life at some point, but we've actually got to ask what's life giving and Mm -hmm. using that phrase, what's light giving right now Mm. and surely it's equipping people where you are Mm. um, in your home, how are you bearing light, Mm -hmm. but particularly always keeping in mind the most vulnerable. Yes. Because it isn't just me and my household, because again, with the divide, I can be very comfortable in my household, especially if I'm in the <laughs> suburban where I am at right now. And I have space and I can, you know, when we were in isolation, I could walk around my garden and I could do things. And so I still need to say, but what does this mean for the most vulnerable? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just me and my household, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I can always ask beyond that question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm getting on. <laughs> so my last Get question. <laughs> <laughs> my last question, I'm not sure if Maxine has hers, but this is my last question. I'm, I enjoyed even the way you said it. People of the Cape of Good Hope Synod, things are not going to go back to normal, nor should we wish them to. 
And I right. enjoyed that. And I think I captured it in the listening report as I listened. And I thought, I'm not going to miss that one. <laughs> Where the one I put it. But it left me thinking, even from then on, uh, up until now, mm-hmm. what things specifically, um, if things are not going to go back to normal, in the situation where I am, I can only think of um, a hybrid form of service, which others would not be able to do, if you see what I mean. I, could, I can only think of um, including technology and the virtual stuff, and then mm-hmm. things may not necessarily get back to normal in that way. Um, but maybe practically, what, what are some of those things? Um, if I were to even think broader than just my context. Mm. Mm. That's it. I mean, I've been thinking a lot around what it, you see, I think part of what I was thinking of, do we want to go back to a world where injustice reigns? No. No, that's, that's the kind of, we can't want to go back to that. Do we want to go back to a world where we are driven you know, 24 hours a day, we work, work, work. You know, we we on the treadmill. Do we want to go back to a world where particularly environmental justice? Mm. I mean, the thing that touched me in the beginning was, you know, those scenes where whole streets and cities closed mm. down. And we had these, you know, in your area, I think penguins were on the pavements. And I mean, that's extreme <laughs> things. But it said, for a moment, the earth rested. Mm. Mm. And, and so do we want to go back to where we go and exploit, you know? Um, do we actually want to go back to maintaining, as I said earlier, six buildings mm. when we could be saying, let's, let's look at using that in a different way. And I think that's the kind of thing you cannot. One, we cannot sustain it. I see the writing is on the wall already, you know? Um, and do we want to... You know, do we do we long to go back to that kind of normal? Do we mm. long back to go back to a church where where many do not feel welcome, mm. whether as I said, based on race or gender or sexuality or whatever? Mm. Because long before we were locked down, there were people who were locked out mm. because they thought differently, they looked differently. Mm. And that's what I was beginning to say. Our reimagination needs to say. What is the kind of people God longs for? Mm. And then translate that, therefore, what does the church look like? Yeah. For me, the key, remember, is again, going our Wesleyan principle, we, we, we were sourced in the class meetings, mm. a gathering of 10 or 12 people. Yeah. And I wonder if that's not the way to go. Mm. Whether we're hoping to gather, and so whether you have people in an area that has no virtual, Mm. But somebody who's able to gather, and maybe not 12, because even 12 is a lot, three Mm. and four. How do we equip three and four people in a household to be the church of God? That ties in. It's not about numbers. You remember, Max? That's exactly what ran through my mind, yeah? Mm. I think those are some of the things going in. <laughs> using our, our, again, the other thing that I'm really pushing is using our beautiful resources for food gardens, you know, sustenance. Our people are starving, mm-hmm. you know, and we have to find a way in which we're able to say, let's scrap the car park, let's put in and let's feed people, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you want to teach people to fish to feed, but how about starting by feeding? Mm. You know, and then teaching. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those kinds of things I think are doable. And to really warm your heart, we can't do it alone. We have to do it with our, um, you know, our sister churches and, mm. by the way, our, our sister faiths. Mm. You know, we've got to join hands, whether it be Muslim, um, you know, uh, whatever it may be, Muslim, Behind, I mean, I'm serving in all these different bodies, and it's amazing. We are just so enriched with one another. We can't do it alone. And that, for me, is the gift of reimagination. <laughs> yeah. He never said I should mention this, so I'm not going to mention the name. One of our <laughs> prominent leaders um, was struggling with COVID and um, had to have an oxygen tank and mm. get who gave him an oxygen tank, Muslim, 
Young Brigade, the youth wow. of the Muslims, giving to sure. this prominent, big um, Christian figure sure. an oxygen tank, helping mm. him breathe. Wow. Yeah. And he's fit and strong now. Anyway, Max, yeah. you have any last thoughts? No, mine are done. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you want thank to you. Say thank you to Again, the I'm putting ideas. You know, I'm, I'm hoping you you write the story for us and share those experiences as we learn from each other. <laughs> yes. Bishop, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for being here just for these few minutes to share with us. And I think we have kept you longer than we thought we would. <laughs> and um, stay warm. Stay safe. We pray for you as our leaders who mm. move around, who are compelled to move around as yeah. you care for those who are vulnerable and those who actually suffer because of being locked down. So we mm. continue to pray for you as you move around and as you care and as you represent the Methodist Church in all areas of our lives as south africa mm. so thank you very much for sharing with thank us. you thank you for the opportunity it's wonderful it feels like i'm home this is home <laughs> every <laughs> church is my home <laughs> thank you for the privilege and blessings that you continue to you know strengthen the people who are disciples of christ thank you and maybe if you can close for us with a word of a blessing then bishop if we can ask you to bless us as we, as we close. Yes. And so loving God, thank you. Thank you for this gracious opportunity. Every home, every person that will be sharing in conversation. We're excited by the fact that you are a God who through your grace shows up and is patient with each one another, with each one of us. As we discover more and more of your grace and your love, and your call upon our hearts. I pray your blessing in each home, every person that experiences and engages with this. I pray particularly your peace over those who, who are facing great hardship, and especially those who mourn. But may we today look to our gracious God, our loving God who weeps with us, but who also smiles with us and calls us to much more calls us into fellowship relationship with yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I pray that that blessing would be upon each of us today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and those whom you love both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. And uh, please pass our greetings to our Anglican friend and your family. I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. You want me to leave? <laughs> I will end. Yeah.